let's talk about the Sacramento Kings. Fantasy basketball, preview, sleepers, busts, all of that stuff. Michael Bolton, come on. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy, your daily NBA fantasy podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. My name is Josh Lloyd and honestly, I'm just here to admire Shohei Otani. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore beeble on TikTok at redrock underscore beeble and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through to September the 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial for NFL Sunday Ticket on YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. So we're going to talk Sacramento Kings, a couple of things. It just happened not you know, an hour ago, half, no, maybe 30 minutes ago, and... Quick aside, like Shohei Tani hitting that like 50-50 club and then putting on one of the greatest like all-time game, single game performances today. Like I, I'm so glad that I was able to get across to the States this season, get to a Dodgers game. Shout out to Evan Phillips who got us uh, got us to that game uh, and see Shohei Cook in that game as well with a I think eighth inning homer. It was just electric. Like the guy is just ridiculous. And now seeing him do it today, like, oh, this is a complete aside, but that's like, that's the stuff that you just get like, and I am not, I'm not a Dodgers fan. I'm actually a Padres fan. My son has converted me to, to being a Padres fan now because that's, you know, his team, that's what we talk about. But it was just electric and seeing that stuff again today, uh, ridiculous stuff. And that is why we, we love sport. That's why we love sport, transitioning into fantasy sport, all that stuff. It's just amazing. I love it. I love it. It's great. Um, Locked on fantasy basketball ball. We're here, we're doing that still. We are taking your applications. Over the next couple of days, you will start to see some invites trickle out. Do not fear. I am going to try my best to accommodate every single person that applies. You may, like, <clears throat> if we get to a stage and it's three weeks later and you, now you chuck an application, you, you might not do it. But I want to try and get everyone as many of the opportunities that they want for categories, for points, for Roto. We want as many people in there for these drafts that will start at the beginning of October. You will get an email when your draft order is set. You will get an invite, so make sure you're checking your, your emails over the next week or two, even even further. Just It is a lot. We're, I'm talking maybe 1,200 teams we're going to have here. So it's obviously a lot for one single legend like me to process. It just takes a little bit of time. So don't be surprised if it just takes a little bit longer, but we are going to start to get in and say, well, these guys didn't accept their invites. They're out. I'll get you guys in. We'll start to fly through them all. It just takes time. So don't be too concerned about, oh, I haven't got this, I haven't got this. It, you don't, it will be okay. You will get this uh, happening. It just takes time for uh, for me to be able to do that. We are here to talk Sacramento Kings, though. That is all that stuff out of the way. A Kings team, which does have really good fantasy contributors, but it's also a team with some differences because they've made free agency moves. We know that in the off season, and that's going to impact how we view this team and where their value lies. So let's take a look at my projected starting five for the Kings. And like most teams, let's lock four of these guys in. Darren Fox, DeMar DeRozan, Keegan Murray, and DeMontis Sabonis. Lock them in. Then there's the one position left. I think we've got three contenders for that spot. I believe that it will be Keon Ellis who starts at shooting guard. I believe that Keon Ellis will start at shooting guard, but he will not play starters minutes. You could have Kevin Herter, who was pretty disappointing last season but maybe he goes in there with spacing. Or the fact that Malik Monk signed at maybe slightly below market, signed before free agency actually opened. Was there a promise of an additional role for Malik? Of course, all of that was before DeMar DeRozan signed. But does Malik Monk start? I don't think he will. Mike Brown has been like, do everything possible in the world to me, and I still will not start Monk. I'd rather, he'd rather have his like dick cut off than start Malik Monk is what it has appeared in the past. So I don't think that Monk will do it. He could, but I think it's going to be between Alice and Herder. I think Alice is going to get that nod of being the starting two guard for Sacramento. Let's um, let's take a look at some undervalued players 
on this Kings team. Again, I don't really care if I think someone's 70th and they come in at rank 75th. That's not really undervalued. I'm looking for bigger gaps than that. And of course, the higher up the draft board you get, the smaller the gap needs to be for it to be important. So let's take a look at three players that I think in certain areas, in certain formats, might be just sitting in the wrong spot. And we'll start off with Demontis Sabonis. And I'll be honest with you. With this, all right, I'll be honest with you on this one. Is I, I don't know, but I do think that Sabonis having a Yahoo rank at seventeen makes him undervalued. Now, obviously, if it's ranked at seventeen, he's not going to be twenty spots better than that because that would mean he'd be ranked minus three, and that is not a real thing. But I think that he should be in that 12, 13, even 11 discussion, maybe nine in points leagues. That's what he does. That's where his value lies for Yahoo Points League. And I think that that rank of 17 is probably just a little bit too low. But what if DeMar DeRozan takes two assists away? What if Sabonis, who's not a high usage player, loses one to two shots? What if you just say, well, I don't want a below average usage player, a sub 20 point scorer, in the first two rounds because I can't catch up. That is all reasonable. For categories, for points, that doesn't matter. What if they decide to not play him 36 minutes and I don't think that's a risk? But, you know, I, I say this and, and I look at where Sabonis has been in his numbers and all that value, and I do think that him sitting at 17 is probably just a bit too low. He's 28, he's right in his prime. He had only 22 usage last season. So again, like he's not coming from a massive, massive usage spot, but 8.2 assists and 13.7 rebounds. Now the rebounds, I'm very, very confident that will hold without any question. Steals and blocks, he's never going to get them. Could 59% from the field go to 61? I guess so. But couldn't shots drop down? Yeah. Could assists fall to seven? Possible. And then that discussion or decision whether um, Sabonis at 17 is value or not, does become more of a of a thought. I still think that looking at him around 12, 13, 14 in categories and 8, 9, 10, 11 in points on Yahoo makes more sense. I think that does um yeah, I think that's that, that's a decent way of uh of approaching that. But it's not going to be for everyone. And we look at where Sabonis sits here ranked on on ESPN, his category league rank is 9. His ESPN Points League rank is 6, which is high. In fact, on an ESPN Points League, 6 is, is actually way too high for me. I'm not going to put him on my overvalued list, but it's pretty close. So, yeah, like he's a uh, one where, again, with all these main movers on this team, we have some concerns. Another guy we can take a look at as an undervalued player is the aforementioned Malik Monk, who... I just, I look at his numbers. His ADP is 131 on Yahoo. It's one, this is crazy. His ADP on Yahoo is 131. His ADP on ESPN is 132. His ADP on Fantrax is 133. So just counting up by one on all the sites. I think that makes him undervalued for category leagues. His points league, Yahoo ADP is 131. His rank is 125. ESPN, his rank is 127 with an ADP of 132. I think he's better than that across categories and points. But, with DeRozan arriving, what if Monk is just not even a part of the closing lineup? What if he is the guy that loses ball handling? Because there was, you know, last season when Sabonis and Fox weren't there, it was Monk doing everything. But now there are these three guys who have the ball in their hand. What if Monk has to take a backseat to what DeRozan does? He had 26 usage. So I guess a lot of you would say that you know, think Monk did more than 26 minutes, 26 usage last season. So it's not that we're sitting in a position where he was playing 30 minutes with 32 usage and just dominating everything because he wasn't. So there is, I guess, a theory that maybe he plays 29 minutes a night and the usage goes to 25, perhaps. He averaged 15 and 5 with two threes. He shot 83 from the line. But the DeRozan thing, again, complicates the scenario. I still like Monk late. You don't have to get him very high. Like I said, it's 130s. We're talking bench-level players. And getting scorers who assist with free throws and threes is not an easy combination at that point in the draft. It just isn't. And while we may have concerns of where the usage goes, I don't think he's playing fewer than 26 minutes a night. We may have concerns about whether that usage falls away or the field goal percentage hurting your team. In a lot of different team structures, Malik, I think, is going to make he's going to make quite a bit of sense uh, for a fantasy squad. And the last one there is Keon Ellis, who I do believe will start. I don't believe will put up awesome numbers, 
But if we're talking 14-team leagues, or even in some situations, 12-team leagues, as a flyer, he's an option. And the reason that I put him here as an undervalued guy is Yahoo's got him ranked 293. And of course, as you know, if you're ranked 293, that means you're not draftable in 20-team leagues, which of course is blatantly nonsense. He's not ranked on ESPN, okay, for category leagues. What does that mean? It means that they're just, as per usual, not paying attention. And Karen Ellis is one of the highlights of why we don't like ESPN as a fantasy platform because he started games last season despite being on a two-way in the 22-23 season and you couldn't add him. He was not in their player database. He had played games the season before. He was on their roster the season before. He was on their roster to begin last season and you could not add Keon Ellis. He took like five days for him to be an addable player after he got starts, which is again what are you? This is the simplest thing in the world. You know what you do? Hey, who's on the NBA roster? Let's load them in. Like uh, the easiest thing in the world. But they don't because they do not care. On Yahoo and even ESPN, like points leagues, he's ranked three hundred thirteenth, so he's least he's on a rank list there. And like, just quietly, that picture of him, his face, he looks like Kevin Hart in the face. Um. He averaged five points in 17 minutes last season, but it's 0.9 steals, 0.5 blocks, and 1.2 triples in those 17 minutes. I don't expect that he plays 34 minutes, but if he plays 25 minutes, and we know the Mike Brown philosophy. If you don't know the Mike Brown philosophy, this is it. If you are not one of the stars, Fox, Sabonis, DeRozan, I'm not, Murray's not included in this. If you hit your first two or three shots, you will play 30 minutes, or you'll play 34 or whatever. If you miss two, three shots in the first quarter, see you later. You'll play 19 minutes. That is what he does. He has done it consistently for two years. So if Alice comes out and goes bang, 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 hits three shots, he'll play 30 minutes. He'll get six deals. He hits six dribbles. The next game, he'll miss his first two shots. He'll play 20 minutes. This is what he does. And that is inconsistency, obviously for a coach, but inconsistency for a player. And Alice will have these games where he has three blocks and three steals and three triples and 10 points and four assists. And he'll go one point on zero of six shooting and no steals and be completely useless. But I thought he established himself as a pretty good defender. He's got good length. He's 25 already. So I guess there's a a little, not concern, but like showing where he is in his career. But he's at least for deeper leagues, someone to pay a bit of attention to and standard league streaming value. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. We have been speaking about FanDuel for a long time. They are America's number one sportsbook. They've been a great supporter of this show and this network for such a long time, and they've got a new offer, and you do not have long to go for this. From now until September the 22nd, FanDuel is offering you a three-week free trial for all customers who place a $5 bet, a three-week free trial for NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. With your YouTube TV base plan, you can go and be able to watch all regular season Sunday afternoon out of market NFL games, you just need a Google account, a valid form of payment, and you can cancel that at any point. But you've got like three days left to be able to go and do that. Go to fanduel.com and download America's number one sportsbook and don't forget to gamble responsibly. Okay, so we've talked the overvalued or the undervalued players and now, of course, the common sense part would be to go to the overvalued players and that's exactly... Uh, that's exactly where we're headed now with the Sacramento Kings. And we're going to talk three starters here who I think are positioned in different formats in the wrong spot. We will start with a man that we will put um, under the lens later on, Darren Fox. Fox is ranked for on Yahoo. I think he's fairly ranked. On ESPN, he's got a rank of 18 for category leagues and 17 for points leagues. I don't think that he's missing those spots by 20, 20 ranks. Again, if we're in the first couple of rounds, I'm not going to go with my usual 20-spot difference. But I think that is just, that's too aggressive. That prices out almost any upside. There's a ton of uncertainty. Like last season, Fox, 26.5 points, three threes. Five and a half assists, two steals. They're great. 47% shooting. 74 only from the line. But he ran at 36 minutes with 31 usage. So what does DeRozan do to him? 29 usage, just six, 5.6 assists become 5.1. And he's also such a weird player. The last two seasons, he has done these weird outlier things. Prime Shaq level finishing at the rim, 76% for one year. 
gone. Just dropped by 12%, up by 15%, down by 12 How do you rely upon that? Well, the answer is you can't. This season, or last 23-24, he came out and shot 42% from three for three months. He went, all right, now this man is Steph Curry. And then that fell off in the second half of the season. And then he said, all right, cool. Now I'm also OJ and Obi, and I'm going to average two steals per game. Now, he's been solid at steals before, but he's never been that level. And we know that steals are incredibly variable. So I don't know what we're going to get. What if he comes out now and turns into Kevin Durant in his a 90% free throw shooter on nine attempts? Honestly, with the random outlier stuff that he has done, I wouldn't be shocked. And then he comes out and shoots 28% on threes and gets one steal a game. He has been all over the shop with doing that. So there's year-to-year weirdness. Now, he could put all of that together and be the seventh best player. He could go back to Shaq rim finishing. He could be Steph from three. He could be OG getting steals. He could make DeMar DeRozan irrelevant in terms of how it impacts him and be a top 10 player. It's very unlikely, but like it could happen. But there's just so much inconsistency with what Fox does that the category rank, the points rank, it's too high on ESPN, 18 and 17. I'm just not in on that. The category ranks on ESPN, which haven't been updated since April the 22nd, have DeMar DeRozan, where he was currently a member of the Chicago Bulls, ranked at number, or sorry, that's not true. He's ADP. So I, I take that back. The, I don't take all that back because the category ranks haven't been updated. But he's ADP, DeMar DeRozan. People are drafting him currently with the knowledge of what is happening at number 30. And if you're in a category league, DeMar DeRozan at number 30 is an insane price to pay. I think it's way too high in a points league too, but it's probably not a large enough gap for me to c- consistently highlight that. That is a ridiculous, a ridiculous position to consider drafting DeMar DeRozan at number 30. There is a chance, and we, we talk about this a lot, there is a chance that he becomes the number three guy. Probably won't be because Sabonis is not a high usage player. But in terms of like, let's say true usage or box creation, what if he's the third guy behind Sabonis and Fox? You're not taking him at number 30. He played the most minutes in the league last season, 38. He's 35 years old of age, he had 26 usage. We can say that he has been healthy. He has. But he's 35, and he might not be. And I, 38 minutes is a very, very unlikely number to repeat, I would think. 24, 4, and 5, with one steal, shot 48 and 85. These are all really strong numbers. He relies incredibly on the mid-range shot. And we'll see whether that falls away, because that impacts the field goal percentage. And then it's about, like, what is going to happen to the assists? What if he is a 22 usage player playing with Fox and Sabonis? We're just not doing that at 30. It is a waste of a very early pick. The last guy on my overvalued list, and there's a lot of players for the Kings who sit on this overvalued list because I just I don't know what it is. I don't know why they're getting valued the way they are. But Keegan Murray just does not need to go at this spot. In category leagues, where he's ranked, like Yahoo's got him ranked 71 with an ADP of 76. ESPN's ADP has him at 75. In a category league, I can see an argument that you take him at 90, which falls within that 20 spot buffer. I don't love it, and I don't know that you necessarily have to. But points leagues, we know what they get driven by. Points leagues are driven by usage, minutes, and heavily weighted into scoring. And Keegan Murray... I think he's going to really struggle to do more of that this season. He had 18 usage last season. Now DeRozan comes in. Very hard for Murray to do more than 18 usage. In fact, he probably does less. It's not like you can say, well, Barnes is gone, so he'll do more of that. Well, Barnes had incredibly low usage, and Murray can't take Barnes' minutes because he was already playing 34 a night. That was already happening. He never gets assists. He defends well, but doesn't generate defensive stats at a high level. One steal, 0.8 blocks is fine, but it's not great. Maybe his field goal percentage goes back up, but that might go back up with a drop in usage. He never gets to the line. Under two assists, five rebounds, which I think will increase because he'll be playing a lot more at the four versus the 4-3 hybrid him and Barnes played. But in a points league at number 70, that's just a waste. Why would I do that when we know that minutes, usage, scoring is what drives fantasy points leagues. And Murray's not stepping up from there. In fact, he's probably going backwards, would be my guess, in terms of where he's positioned and where those um, where those numbers come. Um, if we're going to take a look at the next one, which we are, 
we look at breakout candidates, just guys who I think have a real chance to elevate themselves. And a lot of people would put Keegan Murray on this list. Uh, I will not, because I, I think he's probably more likely to go backwards from last season versus where he is this season, or where he was last season. The only guy I put onto that breakout list is Keon Ellis, because, you know, we played 17 minutes a night. Theoretically, he could play 27 minutes a night. We've spoken a little bit about him and the, the up and down and the consistency and the defensive value. But I don't think we need to get so super excited. He's a streamer. He's a, that sort of a player. And we need to see where the um, where the value sits for him in terms of um, how they use him in the preseason. In terms of looking at some risks and some pressure points and things that can go wrong, let's take a look at where the risks may lie. Well, the number one thing is what happens at shooting guard. Is it Kevin Herter? Is it Malik Monk? Is it Keon Ellis? Is it an absolute three-way nonsense fest between those guys? We have to remember also is they don't have a backup point guard. So Keon Ellis played some backup point guard, so he'll do a little bit of that. Malik Monk will play some backup point guard, but Davion Mitchell had that opportunity last season, screwed it up, and he's gone. So they don't, I suppose they've got Jordan McLaughlin, who that'll probably be the last time I mention Jordan McLaughlin, but he's on this team. But I don't think they'll be running with him. I think they'll be using Alice, Herder, Monk, Fox as their four guard rotation. And that gives a little bit of an extra boost to guys, but who is the starter at shooting guard? That is unsure. Last season, Malik Monk closed almost every game. He was able to run that second unit unimpeded. But will he close again this year? Or will having DeRozan there with Murray and Sabonis and Fox? Like if you put Monk out there, there is no defense. What? There's already no defense with Sabonis and DeRozan together. But that means you're getting Keegan Murray to do everything defensively, and that's not great. And then Monk, would Monk ever get prioritized over DeRozan or Fox? Two of the guys with some of the best clutch records the last two seasons? Probably not either. So that that hurts my thought on maybe Monk's got some value. They need to really ride him hard through the second quarter and that yeah, end of third, start of fourth if he's not going to close games. And they might do that. But that's a that's a worry. Like who who does take the hit? Because three guys, star players don't usually all just do what they did. Now, this is a little bit different because Sabonis is already a low usage player. But what if DeRozan goes from 26 to 21 usage? What if Sabonis goes from 22 to 17? What if it is Fox who jumps from 31 to 25? How do they run this? I, I don't know. And then they've been pretty healthy for two years. Yes, I know, Kings fans. Sabonis hurt his thumb and it lasted all season. He played through it because he's tougher than everybody. He's just so tough. The toughest man in the world. Cool. They did cop some stuff at the end of the season with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, and that probably sunk their chances to get back to the playoffs. But overall, they've still had a very, very, very healthy couple of seasons here. And if they get an extended Fox absence or an extended Sabonis absence, or honestly, an extended or Keegan Murray absence, they become in, they're in trouble. And that will impact a lot of the stuff with fantasy and how guys perform and how all the value gets distributed. That's you know, one of those things that you know, can happen. And we can't really plan for that, but they've had a pretty good run at things. That now makes us or allows us to go under the lens. And we're going to put De'Aaron Fox under the lens. A guy that has, like I said earlier, put up some some really like, I don't know if strange is the right word, but some strange numbers with weird like, huh, I don't know how that continues, sort of production. Fox, the best offensive comp to him last season, according to Crafted NBA, was Ja Morant. And then on defense, it's Cam Reddish. And we can sh- shit on Cam Reddish as much as we want. He was a really good defender. Fox's overall similarity is, unfortunately, Brandon Ingram. But you can see what he did. Look how high that load and creation is. Unbelievably high. But as a point guard, that passer rating is not very good. And we need to see, like, is he just going to roll with usage or where does DeRozan impact that? As a shooter, mid-pack in terms of shooting quality, even though he had that insane run to begin the year in terms of shooting. He is, like, he doesn't take many threes. Defensively, a million deflections. Doesn't mean that he's a good defender. He's He's an improved defender. The steals are good. But we know that there is incredible variability in what steals can do. Over on the right-hand side of this screen, you can see his percent shot assisted. And it is just incredibly low. Only 63% of his three-pointers were assisted. Only 32% of his shots were assisted. So basically, he's doing this stuff off the dribble. 
He's doing this stuff on his own. Does that mean that DeRozan and Sabonis sit around and space the floor? Because that's a terrible idea. Is he just going to have the ball in his hands as much as he did? And we can see that load and creation number is super high. And he does all of this stuff by himself. Now, you could argue easily that what if those percentage assisted numbers improve? Like he was only 20% assisted at the rim. Like what if he just works off the ball more and he does more cutting? And those guys find him and then his field goal percentage rises. That's true. Or what if he just can't really exist in that style of play? This is where, again, like adding a play like DeRozan, it's great. It's talent. It's improving. DeRozan is very clearly better than Harrison Barnes. But it's a very different player. And that might... Somebody is going to have to change what they do. If we look at this basketball index headshot plot for Fox, I've got the main guys here, the main usage players, DeRozan, Fox, Monk, and Sabonis. On the Y-axis, we've got one-on-one shot-making efficiency. So talking about when you are... working unassisted, how good are you at doing it? On the x-axis, we're talking about offensive involvement rate, like which is what it is. These are metrics that Basketball Index, they create a million different metrics, which are great. Just showing you how much you are involved in the offense. And the guy in the top right corner is DeMar DeRozan. Not only does he have the highest offensive involvement rate that is coming from Chicago, but he was also the best at one-on-one shot making efficiency. So why do I want to highlight that? Well, the highest guy in the Kings last season for offensive involvement was Darren Fox, who also had the best one-on-one shot-making efficiency. But if you are bringing in DeMar DeRozan, what do you want to do? Do you want Fox to remain the number one and DeRozan takes a big step back despite him being better at being this guy? I'm not sure. You can see Malik Monk, who's got a really high offensive involvement rate as well. Doesn't convert them very well, but he's right down there. And then Sabonis is you know, not a high offensive involvement guy, which is you know, an interesting Thing for someone who people think is the King's best player. I don't, but people do. And he one-on-one is not as good. But something has to give with the addition of DeRozan, who is better in these two metrics that I that I displayed here, better than what Fox is and Monk and Sabonis. And how that impacts De'Aaron is interesting. The Darko graph is not his overall Darko numbers. It's his rim field goal attempt. So while he had that amazing Shaq-like season, look, at he just stopped getting to the rim. Back in the 2020-21 season, he was going at like almost seven attempts per game. This year, he was down, and by, and by the way, he ended the season under four attempts at the rim per game. Now, maybe that opens up. Maybe he cuts more. But he settled a lot more this season, Darren, for pull-up threes above the break. He still gets to the rim a decent amount, but that is a big change in his game. And shots at the rim are efficient. He had those insane percentages. There's a chance that yeah, at this age of 26 or 27, maybe he falls a little bit more in love with mid-ranges or threes, and that impacts him a little bit too. If we have a look at the fantasy similarity scores, the names are all unbelievably good. Donovan Mitchell, Anthony Edwards, Paul George, and Kyrie Irving. Edwards is probably going to go in round one. Mitchell may be round one. Paul George will go in round three and probably be a steal, and Irving towards the end of round two. And so Fox is similar. Now, you can see he's the thick blue line. He steals are higher than everybody's, and we expect that that is going to come down. I would put money on Fox not averaging two steals a game again. But the shape of what he's doing compared to those guys, he's very similar. So he is really good. The difference between him and Mitchell and Edwards and less, less so George, but he has to adapt now to a new player arriving. And how that works or how he deals with that remains to be seen. Let's take a look at some injury concerns, which usually on this team is just not an issue. But we do have three things to talk about because Malik Monk, who is MCL at the end of last season, never returned. Kevin Herter had a six-month shoulder reconstruction, obviously never returned. And then their rookie who they picked at, what pick was it, 13 or 14, Devin Carter, he had a shoulder reconstruction. He's probably not going to be back um, until we hit January. Obviously, as a rookie, that is not ideal. And that is going to you know, take him out of a lot of development time and mean that he becomes you know, relatively useless for this season, I would guess. Let's talk a little bit about fan of pants Kevin Herter, who I thought was really quite bad last season. I faded him in nearly all drafts, and that worked out well for me. But only 24 minutes, 17 usage. 10 points, two threes, 2.6 assists. And part of the appeal of Herder in the past has been, well, he can shoot, cool. And he can do a little bit of ball handling. He's got some size. He works as like a backup point guard. But again, the addition of DeRozan, the need for Alice's defense means that where the hell does Herder fit in? 
He's not going to have ball handling opportunities. He's not probably even going to hit the 24 minutes that he played last season. And he's coming off an injury. Surely there is nobody considering drafting Kevin Herter in standard leagues. But you know what? You never know, do you? If I go and have a look, just to double check where he's... Oh, no. Oh, no. He should have been on my overvalue because uh, Kevin Herter has an ESPN ADP of 128. <sighs> All right. Well, that's obviously stupid and crazy and should not be the case. But on fan tracks for Kevin Herter, his ADP is 461, which seems insane as well. Like, why would he be down that low? But anyway, uh, Herter ranked 190 for ESPN points is a little bit more normal. But that ADP of 128 is very, very silly, I think, when we're talking about what Kevin Harder, Kevin Harder, Kevin Herter um, could potentially bring. That does bring me to talk about their rookie, Devin Carter, who people thought would be able to you know, contribute immediately. And like, he's not. Like, even with the injuries, he probably wasn't going to. He's a little bit undersized as a player. He had 28 usage at Providence last season. And I know this is wrong, but I'm getting Chris Dunn, the Providence guard who's really good at defense, who you go, well, maybe, maybe he's going to be offensively good. And I don't think that Carter is going to be that. He averaged 19 points. He's an unbelievably good rebounder. He's got great feel for the game and the steal and block numbers are superb. But he is undersized. The shooting, I do not buy at all. I don't think that he's a point guard. And he won't be a point guard on this team. So I'm just not as big into Devon. And he's just not going to play to begin this season. Which, of course, is a downer. You know, we'd love him to be out there. And he is really good at defense. But is the offense going to be able to catch up at all? don't know. Let's look at the Kings and their schedule. I feel like every year the Kings, for whatever reason, and I don't know the reason, but they always seem to have a good fantasy basketball playoff schedule. And it's no real difference this season. They've got 51 quality games. It's towards the high side. They've got 16 back-to-backs, which is the most, but no one on this team is really a risk of this, of, of, of missing games necessarily. They've got 15 maximum game weeks, which is on the second most, the high side. And they're playoffs. If you end on March the 23rd, they go 4-3-4. If you do March 30th, they go 3-4-4. And then the last four weeks of the season are all four game weeks. Yahoo default puts them 4-4-4. That's the maximum. ESPN default puts them 4-4-4-4, which of course is the maximum as well. Again, I feel like every single year in the fantasy playoffs, the Kings always have one of the best schedules. This is good enough to make sure if you're on the fence about Sabonis, if you're on the fence about what you're doing with DeRozan or maybe taking a later flyer on a Murray or looking at DeRozan in the 50s or 60s, think of these playoff schedules at least don't take anything away and they are the best in a lot of these areas. And that is often something that you know doesn't apply to every team very clearly. Let's look at the young players on this team. And this is a weird squad in, in this regard, the Kings, because they're an up-and-coming team, Right? They made the playoffs two years ago. They didn't this season. They broke that drought. And you go, oh, they're up and coming. They're going to get better. These are the three guys they have that are under 23. And the numbers you see there are based on my Bazemore Dynasty metric. They've got Devin Carter, who's barely under 23. I don't actually rate him that highly for Dynasty for a couple of reasons. I worry about the shooting. I worry about the assists and his age. And this season, he's going to be like out as well. That's not a good mix. I've got him top 200. I don't love him. The other two players they have that are under the age of 23 are both, to me, top 325 guys for Dynasty. It's Colby Jones, who's in his second season. Yes, that is a... They've got three guys called Jones on this team, by the way. Mason Jones, Colby Jones, Isaac Jones. So Colby Jones. And then two-way guy, Isaiah Crawford, who put up good numbers in college, but he's he's about to turn 23 in about two months. He's had multiple knee injuries, ACL injuries. He's got some real shooting concerns. He's sort of like a point guard who is six foot nine, who will probably not play as a point guard. Shout out to like Dalen Terry. And that's it. They are their young players. Like Keegan Murray's still young, but he's like 24. Monk's like 26 and was 27. And Sabonis, or Monk, yeah, uh, sorry, Fox is 27 and Sabonis is 28. But they're prime. They don't have this group of super, super young guys coming through. And I think we look at this team as this, you know, the up and coming, they're building, they're building. And that's true, but most guys are in this sort of prime range. With Murray, the, the guy that you know, doesn't quite qualify for this, because I'm looking under 23, and he's very clearly not under 23. He's like 24 and a half. 
So it, it is a, a team that if you don't really pay a huge amount of attention, you'd think that they have a lot of more younger guys and they don't. They don't have anyone. If we have a look at the risk versus reward options on this team, again, looking at variance and statistical uh, variance, not minutes necessarily. DeRozan's the one who who stood out to me here. Of course, there are there's variance in a lot of guys, but his category league ranking variance based on the stats is 76. That's very big. Like Worst case scenario based on variance, very unlikely to happen, puts DeRozan outside the top 100. And his fantasy points variance is about 6.4 points, which is usually about three to four rounds in the mid-rounds of a fantasy points draft. Other guys obviously had variance associated with them. That's how variance works. And I could tell you that Darren Fox's fantasy points variance was higher than anybody's at 7.9. I could tell you that Keegan Murray's category variance at 79 was the most as well. Actually, that's not true because Keon Ellis's was 90. But I think DeRozan having a very big points difference as well as a big category difference is, is the guy that I did want to um that I did want to highlight here. That will then bring me on to talk about anyone over the hill who's at the decline phase. And these are the guys that are over the age of 29. And while I did, I guess you could say criticize them for not having super young players, they don't have any super old players either, apart from 35 year old DeMar DeRozan and 31 year old Alex Len. Len, backup center. They'll pro- play a little bit of Trey Lyles in that position this season. I'd hope they get some Orlando Robinson in there as well. Len is old. He sort of comes in. He plays his... Oh, I, might, I, I created this graphic for Alex Len. Alex Len. I don't know why I did, but I did. So I might as well put it up. But like, he comes in. He plays his little role. He you know, played... What did he play? Like nine minutes a game last season. He blocked 0.7 shots in those minutes. He shot 62%. And if they need someone to come in and do that, he does it. And, and that's you know, sort of finding your role and finding your position. But he is also old. So when we talk about a, a player like Len, like we're not relying too much, but we also know that like what happens if Sabonis goes down, because that's your option. It could be Orlando Robinson. It'll be a little bit of Trey Lyles as well, who's not a part of this decline phase area, but he's not super far off. Like he's about to turn 29 this season. He's six foot nine, Trey Lyles. He played 20 minutes a night. He had this crazy block rate two years ago that went back to being Trey Lyles with 0.3 blocks a game. His shooting numbers were really low. And at times, the small ball center with him works, but it sort of didn't work as well last season. So they're a team that has got these guys in these positions of strength. They don't have super old players. They don't have young players. But they're also at pretty significant risk if something did happen to Sabonis. Like if Fox went down, I think they'd be all right. They'd piece it together. There's Alice and they'd run more DeRozan at point. And they'd run more Malik Monk, even though they don't have a true point guard. But I wouldn't say that Fox is a true point guard in that sense anyway. But if Sabonis goes down, you know what? Maybe maybe they'd better if they just chuck a low usage shop locking guy in there. Maybe that just changes. But you could argue they might be better, but they'd be different. Very different. And a mid-season switch like that is almost impossible to pull off. So that would be where the concerns are. But look, we talk, you know, Talked about DeRozan already. Talked about Alex Len uh, in these old guys. These are the old guys on this team. And they're not like... yeah. They're, so they're not super old. They're not super young. That is the the basics of this team, I think. I don't need to go into too many of these other guys. I think we've covered everyone off. So we might as well just do a little bit of a summary of, of where we sit on this Kings team. I, I think Sabonis is a nice early round second, uh, early second round player. You might take that into the first in points. Fox is probably a late second. More probably third because of the unknown. What if he loses four usage points? What if he loses 5.6 assists to 4.6? Those steals, they're heavily reliant. What if they fall off? DeRozan, fifth, sixth round, 50s, 60s. Definitely not 20s or 30s. Someone is taking a hit. Keegan Murray, we are not touching in the 70s. Absolutely not. 90s, 100s, maybe. Malik Monk, late round, I like it, but a lot of variance. A lot of like what happens. What if he does play fewer than 26 minutes? What if he does just, what if he just doesn't get the ball in his hands as much? That's possible too. And then you've got the Alice's and the Herders and Lyles and those guys for your late round flyers. And then you in deeper leagues, maybe it is Orlando Robinson 
who takes a crack at getting some of Alex Len's minutes. That's the Kings. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumb up, leave your comments down below. I'll ask this question here. Do you think that the Kings make the playoffs this season? I haven't done my projections or predictions yet. Off the top of my head, I say no, but I want to hear your thoughts. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.